Once again, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Beata Faracik, and I'm the co-founder and president of the Polish Institute of Human Rights and Business. And it's with great pleasure to welcome you to the first of the series of four webinars that complement the first ever Central and Eastern European and Central Asia Summer Academy on Human Rights and Business that we have held earlier in September this year. Um, each of the webinars, as you might know already, will be dedicated to a different issues. And we start today with a webinar on the topic of equality, diversity, and inclusion challenges and how to answer them. Um, then the next webinar held on October, um, oh, sorry, held on November the 8th will focus on the ethical principles of business and NGO cooperation. Webinar number three will be uh, and we'll look back at that time at how to hold corporations accountable and at the impact of jurisprudence and non-judicial mechanisms. And finally, we'll close the series with a webinar held on the December 6th with a closer look at children's rights in the business context. Um, I should stress that both the Summer Academy and the webinar series are organized as part of the project Lighthouse Keepers Business and Human Rights Cooperation Network, which is conducted by Polish Institute for Human Rights and Business in partnership with the Ukrainian Yaroslav Modri National Law University, ALDA, Association for Sustainable Democracy from Iceland, and Icelandic Ombudsman for Children, and the project benefits also from a grant under Active Citizens Fund, regional from Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway through the uh, EA grants. And as mentioned already, uh, today's webinar is the first in the series, and during it we will explore ways of answering challenges to the equality, diversity, and inclusion that are faced in the business context, I would say more broadly in the work environment. And before I hand over to the host of today's webinar, Dr. Elena Uvarova, let me just add that you are welcome to post question and answers, um, uh, questions, apologies, uh, in the Q&A section, but also in the chat. And we'll do our best to have some answered by our speakers at the end of today's webinar. Uh, we have 15 minutes allocated for that. Um, now, let me hand over now without any further delay to Dr. Elena Uvarova, who is Associate Professor and Chair of the International Lab on Business and Human Rights, Angelos Rapmutri National Law University in Ukraine, and visiting researcher in Wageningen University and Research Law Group. And Elena will introduce the speakers of the first part, and then later on, I'll also introduce the later um, speakers of the second section of today's webinar when we'll look into d and toolkit. Helena, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Beata, and thank you all our participants. It's a really great honor um, to, to be part of this series of webinar and actually of all Summer Academy. Um, and uh, thank you very much, uh, the team of Polish Institute for Human Rights and Business for this great work. Uh, yeah, and I would like to start uh, with introduction uh, of the first part of our webinar and our speakers during the first part. Uh, it's uh, uh, they are Dr. Khalida Ajubulova, the UN and OECD International Consultant on Promoting Women's Rights. Uh, she represents Kazakhstan, and also Irina Fedorovich, Director of the Center Social Action Researcher and trainer on human rights, non-discrimination and inclusion. She represents Ukraine. Uh, and um, I see that the great one of the huge uh, challenge for us today uh, is to find the understanding of uh, the correlations and uh, interconnections between uh, two frameworks, uh, business and human rights framework and diversity and inclusion framework, because uh, for a long time, um, I would say these two frameworks uh, actually developed in parallel way in uh, 
some understanding and uh, diversity and inclusion framework was considered and maybe still is considered as uh, something uh, like a part of corporate social responsibility is something actually voluntary for companies uh, uh, and actually companies um, could could make a decision to to follow diversity and inclusion or not to follow and um, business and human rights frameworks have been blind uh, to gender and other differences for a long time as well and actually i i should note it from very beginning that we will focus uh, on gender issues uh, but uh, of course we understand that uh, actually non-discrimination and equality um, standards uh, are much much broader and and of course, we should uh, we should remember about all kinds um, of um, uh, po possible uh, uh, discrimination. And uh, but uh, as as we know, business and human rights and uh, human rights due diligence is about prioritization as well. And um, that's why our key focus today is on the gender equality but with taking into consideration um, of all kinds uh, of discrimination and inequalities. So, uh, as I said before, business and human rights framework have been blind uh, to gender and other differences and assumed that all people who experience human rights harms um, in the same way, um, human rights harms or human rights abuses is always uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights says human rights impacts, uh, negative impacts, uh, but uh, it was um, a picture that this experience uh, uh, really could uh, could be um, uh, could be experienced in the same way. Our webinar is about understanding that there are many dynamic experience of gender, sex, nationalities, disabilities, family obligations, races, political choices, languages issues, and many, many other issues. This diversity of experience requires more than a separate set of principles, uh, for example, um, LGBTQ issues or people with disability issues or women issues um, in business and human rights discourse. We need to recognize that uh, the structures of harm or impact to which business and human rights response are not neutral, but multi-faced, intersectional, fluid and context specific. And I would like to recommend you, if you didn't before, um, to, to read actually um, the special issue on gender equality, which was pub of Business and Human Rights Journal, with, which was published this year in February and collected a lot of interesting thoughts and ideas um, about actually feminist approach on business and human rights uh, issues uh, and uh, propose, uh, I think, uh, a really, really interesting and efficient way to rethink uh, uh, the disbalance that we have today and why actually diversity and inclusion uh, umbrella should help uh, business and human rights framework to be to be resort, I would say. And uh, actually, uh, all these issues are about the distribution of power and resources among people, among different people, and it's crucial for understanding how their social roles and responsibilities are constructed and exercises and what barriers exist for substantial justice and equal access um, 
to human rights. Uh, we also agree with a point and want to mention it that it's impossible to find sustainable solution simply by incorporating vulnerable or marginalized groups into existing unequal institutions and structures. And uh, that's why we see that uh, diversity and inclusion type of thinking for corporations uh, could help uh, them to find uh, these sustainable solutions. Because uh, just by state regulation, just by business and human rights tools and manuals and standards, we can't find, um, we can't find these sustainable solutions really without diversity and inclusive environment. Um, and uh, for a long time, business and human rights theory and practice was about exclusion and silencing, unfortunately, and now there is a shift to inclusion and diversity, and these interconnections uh, are becoming more and more strong and uh, I would say that it's even hard to find a very strict line uh, to, to, to make difference between business and, and human rights framework and um, diversity and inclusion framework, especially when we are talking about responsible business conduct. Uh, I, I uh, can find this strict line if we are talking about state duty to protect, but it's really uh, hard to find and maybe it's uh, even uh, there is no reason to have this strict line for corporate responsibility to respect human rights. So um, I, I would like uh, actually to give this floor to our first speaker because um, in the context of the need of safety environment and actually for for our region um i eastern europe and central asia region uh safety environment and um, equal environment equal opportunities environment is uh, crucial and our uh, first uh, uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Um, Khalida Ajgulava, will speak actually about sexual harassment as part of uh, gender disbalance and unsafe environment. And uh, together with all our um, all are the dimensions of uh, gender inequality in our region as uh, gender disbalance um, in, uh, uh, in, in the sphere of employment, um, gender gap uh, um, uh, in uh, wages uh, uh, and uh, gender uh, discrimination and uh, gender actually uh, represent representation uh, it's a um, it's a stage of decision making. Uh, all all these issues are part of this gender disbalance, and uh, it's really important to see what steps could be implemented to change this situation. And uh, it's uh, really important to see how experts in our region work with this issue because. Uh, to to work with these issues beyond the region is one case and uh, to work um, with this issue when you are part of this environment is uh, another case so um, please um, dr halida um, actually could you share with us your experience to work with the issue of sexual harassment and uh, do you have uh, positive examples in our region and um, what uh, key obstacles you see to improve uh, the safety environment for women dear lena uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this event. Indeed, I sincerely uh, thank the organizers of the event, of the webinar, for raising such an important issue. 
uh, in my country, I deal with the issues of uh, sexualized harassment since um, uh, 2019. Um, and um, yes, so right now in my presentation, I would like to share with you uh, with some important uh, points. So what is the uh, current situation in Kazakhstan? What are the current legal gaps uh, that actually give way and um, to sexualized harassment? Uh, we have our constitution, uh, which in Article 18 states that everyone has rights to protection of his or her honor and dignity. And we know that uh, sexual harassment is a type of, of offense that uh, aims to diminish uh, the other person's uh, dignity. And uh, also according to Article 34 of our constitution, everyone is obliged to comply uh, with the constitution legislation, respect the rights, freedoms, honor, and dignity of other people. However, uh, when we talk about sexual, sex, sexual harassment in Kazakhstan currently, there is no definition of sexual harassment there is no explicit prohibition of sexual harassment either at the workplace or in public places. And uh, there, is, there are no legal sanctions for committing sexual harassment. And uh, indeed, this issue is uh, quite uh, serious uh, in business areas uh, because quite often women um, who want to be promoted to higher positions, sometimes they may be intentionally harassed by their male colleagues. They may be intentionally harassed in order to force them to leave the office, to leave the company. And that's why uh, indeed right now, this is a very serious issue in our country. And unfortunately, uh, in, business in, in business companies, in any organization in Kazakhstan, there are no um, internal mechanisms that could help uh, prevent uh, sexualized harassment at the workplace and protect the survivors of sexual harassment. What we have instead uh, is um, in our administrative offenses code, we have an article 434, uh, which talks about petty hooliganism. And this is the article that uh, is quite often used uh, by the police uh, whenever they get complaints about sexualized harassment. But you can see that uh, the article itself contains several uh, several offenses, so and very diverse offenses, including uh, using obscene language in public places, offensive harassment to individuals, uh, desecration of residential premises, and so on. And um, th uh, and this is uh, an administrative offense for which the punishment is about uh, is a fine of around thirty USD uh, US dollars or an arrest up to 20, ten days. And the issue right now is that. Uh, since uh, 2019, uh, I and other um, prominent NGOs, so women's rights NGOs in Kazakhstan, we have been advocating uh, to include a separate uh, definition and punishments for sexual harassment in our legislation. However, we are always told by the Ministry of Interior, by the General Prosecutor's Office, that there is no need for this. And allegedly, we can always use uh, this Article 434. However, the problem is that because there is no definition, no official definition of sexual harassment, uh, no prohibition and no punishment, it also means that there is no official statistics. There is no monitoring of this issue and there are no official measures to combat this issue. So basically our government, uh, by not introducing the official definition and punishment for sexual harassment, including at the workplace, basically uh, does not do anything to uh, further uh, combat this issue. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the more I researched this problem, the more I was trying to understand why is there so much resistance towards, um, towards introducing the definition and punishment for sexual harassment in our legislation, the more I understood that this issue is also a problem of systemic discrimination of women in Kazakhstan. And here uh, at, on the slide, you can see how many women uh, in power we have in Kazakhstan, how many uh, women in decision-making positions we have in Kazakhstan. And you can see that, they're, that the numbers are indeed very low. Uh, among the ministers, we have less than 5%. Um, in the among the mayors of uh, our regions, um, less than six percent, 
uh, heads of agencies, other bodies under the president, something around 20%. And among the uh, members of parliament, we have upper chamber, lower chamber of parliament. You can see, again, the numbers are less than 30%. And then if we, if we look at the situation with the law enforcement agencies, uh, we can see that, for example, at the level of Minister of Interior, at the level of General Prosecutor's Office, for the last 30 years, meaning uh, from the, uh, since the moment of independence of our country in 1991, we have never had any woman at the decision-making position, at the highest the political levels, the highest uh, senior decision-making level. So, uh, for the last 30 years, and the, uh, and the situation is the same right now, 100% of decision makers at central and local levels in the Minister of Interior and General Prosecutor's Office are all men, no women. And uh, the judicial system, uh, in the judicial system, yes, we have um, more gender balance, but again, we have uh, almost equal amount of men judges and women judges. But again, when we talk about the chairpersons of courts, um, so... The problem is that there is not a single woman ch uh, chairperson of the court at the regional level and at the level of the Supreme Court, uh, while at the lowest um, level, 18.7% of chairpersons of courts are women. So what it tells us that basically um, the people who are currently uh, resisting criminalization uh, of sexualized harassment uh, people who can never be survivors or can never be subjected to sexualized harassment. So basically, the Minister of Interior or the General Prosecutor, they undermine the issue. They don't even see this as an issue. Um, it means that they think that if I'm not uh, subjected to sexual harassment, uh, then it means that no one um, is subjected. So unfortunately, we have this really... Uh, serious problem at the decision maker level when uh, decision makers think not the, from the perspective of objective reality, but they actually think from the perspective of their own understanding and their own self interest. So that's why we say that this is a systemic issue of discrimination of women in general in Kazakhstan. So in order to combat this uh, situation, I have been undertaking uh, several advocacy uh, campaigns. And one of the campaigns was a petition. Uh, and in June 2021, I wrote a letter, a petition to the president uh, with a request uh, and recommendations uh, and uh, quite detailed um, research, um, research reasoning uh, that it is important for our country to ratify the ILO Convention uh, Against Violence and Harassment, number 190. Uh, we all, I also asked to introduce prohibition of sexual harassment in labor code of Kazakhstan and to oblige all employers, uh, regardless um, of their organization or form, to adopt and implement internal policies on prevention of sexual harassment at workplace. And uh, I then shared this petition among all uh, human rights, women's rights and jobs in Kazakhstan, and uh, the petition gathered a lot of support and more than uh, 30 NGOs um, and prominent uh, public figures, they signed uh, this petition and we sent it to the president. And what was the result? Uh, just to um, remind that we had it in June 2021, the president issued a decree this year in which he tasked the Ministry of Justice only to present its views on ratification of this ILO convention by the end of 2023. So basically, again, it says that uh, we face a lot of resistance uh, regarding uh, the issue of combating uh, sexual harassment in Kazakhstan. And I hope that maybe in this, de in this decree, the president would task the Ministry of Justice to ratify the convention. But again, we see that, um, uh, uh, that the Ministry of Justice uh, by the decree is tasked only to present its views. And the use may be again that there is no need uh, to ratify this convention. And again, everything is fine in our country. Uh, thank you very much. This is a, a short uh, presentation and uh, just wanted to mention that regardless of, the, of this resistance, uh, myself and my fellow colleagues, we continue advocacy campaign and advocacy work in our country to, uh, to prevent uh, sexual harassment and to introduce legal definition and prohibition of sexual harassment in our legislation. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation, uh, Lea Halida. And uh, I just kindly remind that all questions and all comments uh, could be addressed in our chat and uh, in Q&A. And uh, we, we will be back uh, to all questions and comments after all presentations. And actually, again, I, I just uh, want to mention that um, such uh, conventions, uh, yeah, as example uh, 190 on violence and harassment convention, um, actually, yeah, they uh, propose uh, the number of actions uh, for member states, and uh, these actions are about uh, uh, prohibiting in law violence and harassment, yeah, ensuring that relevant policies address violence and harassment, uh, comprehensive strategy should be adopted and so on and so forth. But uh, um, again, yeah, uh, why we are talking about more broader, more broader framework, diversity and inclusion, because as we see from our previous experience, in particular in our region, that adaptation of uh, any international standards could be effective just if uh, the appropriate environment uh, actually exists and uh, the appropriate again type of thinking and corporate culture is developed, um, and um, yeah, and that's why we would like to raise a question about what tools could be proposed, could be developed, uh, especially with taking into consideration these regional challenges, uh, and um, with taking into consideration context specific. Uh, analysis. So what tools could be proposed? And um, that's why I would like to give the floor to Irina, Irina Fedorovich, uh, who has actually experience of developing such tools and which raise uh, the question of diversity and inclusion uh, before companies. Uh, so Irina, please, the floor is yours. I hope that uh, all uh, challenges that uh, we have in Ukraine now is not a barrier to join us uh, today for you. Hi, nice to hear. Uh, well, I hope my connection stays more or less stable. Uh, stable. If not, I will switch off the camera. I don't have slides for this reason, but I'm really happy to be with you today. Uh, First of all, I wanted just to reflect a little bit on what previous speaker said, uh, saying that, okay, in Ukraine, we have slightly better situation in terms of legislation, because we have a definition of sexual harassment, both in a, in a special law on equality of men and women, uh, and we also have a definition of sexual harassment in a criminal court, but actually, the analysis of a case law we did uh, last year and still about to publish uh, shows that the number of cases brought despite we have this definition is still really really low which uh, brings me back to the uh, last comment uh, from Lena is that we still lack uh, we have legal change challenges in our countries but we also have a challenges uh, in terms of explaining to people how to use uh, the, so that mechanism, even if we have them in place. What I'm trying to say is that uh, one thing is to get a legal definition, but the uh, totally other thing and is more challenging is to explain to people how to use this legal, legal mechanism to employ actually women to uh, make uh, claims about sexual harassment, to bring them either to companies if there are uh, internal redress mechanisms within companies, uh, which we do not have in Ukraine mostly, or to courts or to police, depending on what happened, and to push all this uh, to, to, to do something. Because again, uh, coming back to the uh, legal analysis, the, the little number of cases we have on sexual harassment, uh, which were tried by course, shows that uh, judges completely do not understand the nature of what is uh, discrimination in general and what is sexual harassment and who has an obligation to to, to bring what kind of uh, proof and who has the, the burden actually of proof uh, despite again that we have uh, this definition 
now on legal legislation. So what we are trying to do now in Ukraine is generally, uh, not only in terms of the gender discrimination, but regarding all types and forms of discrimination is to raise awareness uh, among uh, people who face discrimination that they should use uh, whatever legal mechanism we have and more actively and bring these cases because only bringing the cases we can teach the at least the digital system to to kind of educate itself that was one comment and the other coming back to uh the intra uh, alana did uh and from our experience working with companies within the Ukrainian index of corporate equality, to which I will come in, in a sense, and um, my private practice as a, as a consultant with uh, with businesses, I'd say that uh, despite the fact that uh, globally uh, companies are usually using uh, diversity, equality, and inclusion as a day, uh, as a Descri description of the process uh, in Ukraine, it's easier for companies to skip the equality and only talk about the diversity and that we do because of a goodwill, uh, forgetting that there is equality in this and equality is not a goodwill. Again, this is a legal obligation because we hold the legislation in place, which somehow uh, is a missing part sometimes uh, from the business perspective. But I'm trying to say that, um, again, this part we have the legislation prohibiting discrimination and uh, how to say telling the business about the red lines what they should do what they should not do in terms of uh, sticking to this uh, all uh, non-discrimination rules uh, the, the awareness about this is still pretty low and this was actually the reason why we started the Ukrainian Equality uh, Index back uh, in 2015. Uh, there are actually two reasons. First, uh, Ukraine changed its legislation in attempt to, to, to bring it closer to the EU minimum standards. So we had our anti-discrimination law back in 2012, uh, and then later we introduced some changes into the labor court and also the laws prohibiting the uh, discriminatory advertisement and all that stuff but we noticed that there is very little change in terms of people using the legislation and claiming actually discrimination despite when you ask people how you see discrimination they, the first thing they mention is employment discrimination and the other thing we noticed that the companies are not doing actually enough in this sphere and uh, we also have been uh, reading about the great work done uh, in states uh, by colleagues uh, LGBT NGO trying to to popularize the, the the topic of equality uh, among the biz and doing this um, reading, you know, uh, analysis of how companies are sticking to diversity, equality, and inclusion, and uh, our colleagues from the Falkrom NGO, this is the LGBT NGO, come up with the idea to start this um, self-assessment uh, tool uh, for Ukrainian business, uh, and they approached also. Uh, NGOs working with in the equality uh, of women issues and also NGOs working with the uh, people with disabilities and asked them if they want to partner and we ended up having uh, a group of NGOs and uh, the first uh, equality index uh, looked like uh, as a self-assessment uh, tool uh, with three uh, blocks of questions. Uh, one is about uh, how the company is sticking to uh, their obligations in terms of of uh, accessibility and employment of persons with disability. Uh, the other block was about gender equality, uh, how the po policies and uh, the conduct companies, again, sticking to the, all the obligations we have in this sphere. And the last block of questions and the most difficult uh, the, the first years was how the company is open to realizing that some of the staff might be gay. So we had these three blocks, uh, each of 10 questions and the rating system. And uh, I think the, the major accomplishment uh, of the all the years we've been doing this uh, is is to actually raise awareness among the companies that there, there is an option to do this self-assessment uh, that you might have some policies inside, even most of your staff is not realizing that these policies are and making the, the topic visible. We started with like 20, 30 companies in the first couple of years, mostly international companies with Ukrainian officers being open enough to go through this self-assessment, filling the questionnaire and uh, giving us uh, permission to publicize the results 
uh, by like third, fourth year, we had more than 50 and slowly uh, Ukrainian companies joining. Now we have like 100, 150, depending on a year. But companies are more open to fulfill and we make made it sim simpler uh, last uh, last year. Uh, just ten questions instead of thirty, uh, covering all the questions, uh, all the all, all three issues I mentioned previously. And uh, the the other thing, man, uh, besides uh, raising awareness and kind of showing that it's possible, it's not painful, and you can do it, and you have uh, something to share and something to be proud of uh, for some companies who have some policies. Uh, we also saw that there is a kind of educational effect coming from from this because uh, well. First of all, it's it's nice to show something good you're doing. Uh, the other companies started coming back and asking for consultation and asking if you can help us uh, to to improve some policy or if you can help us and find us some providers we want to do an education. Uh, companies started being more um, active, especially again uh, Ukrainian offices of international companies joining all this uh, day work uh, done at the global level because before that we noticed that uh, the hot headquarters, the, the global companies might be quite open about uh, quite a range of things like joining the pride months or you know showing that they are inclusive uh in terms of um, employing people with disabilities but Ukrainian uh, offices being kind of totally out of that uh slightly it changed uh Ukrainian offices started joining these global uh companies uh activities uh, and asking Ukrainian social uh, NGOs uh to to help them to to, to, to educate and to be more included in this work. So I consider this is the, like the, the second uh, thing we managed with this um, Ukrainian Equality Index. Uh, and so our last goal, uh, which we hoped to, to pursue this year, we started last, uh, but actually we stopped, was to try and think uh, how to engage small companies. Because again, uh, when Index started, uh, it was for big companies. You know? it's easier for them to be open they have more resources they have they are more formalized they have more policies and it's easier for them to to, to explain to them why they need it and it's easier for them to show good results uh at the same time um, from the beginning uh we heard from media and small business that uh, this is not for us this is too complicated we do not have such formal policies we do not know know what to do and if we are only 10 or 15 people we do not have problems so we've been thinking on how to adopt the self-assessment tool for the small business but we also been thinking how to reach them and how to start talking with a small business that they also have equality issues so to pay attention so and it, it's it's not so course compulsory that we have to do this through the self-assessment tool there might be some some other options but unfortunately we stopped this work because of our invasion but again uh something we cannot present yet but uh, we started working on developing an open self-assessment tool uh, for Ukrainian business and I hope we will be able to present it next year and we'll have something easier for, for companies uh, to engage with. Probably I'll stop here and again if there are any questions or clarifications the chat is open. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Irina. And uh, yeah, um, actually, Beata, Beata shared uh, in, uh, in the chat of one of the tools actually it's a really a really good tool uh, from uh, from shift uh, um, about uh, right to respect in the culture and uh, what leadership and governance indicators could be used by companies uh, to identify how their culture and leadership style of the top management support or not respect for human rights including equal treatment it's a really um, good tool um, I, I can share my my preference uh, among among the different tools and uh, instruments that uh, were developed. Actually, um, I, I I can be. Uh, 
not, not, uh, not an interesting person because uh, I like, uh, to be honest, very much the report uh, uh, which uh, was prepared uh, by working group on business and human rights. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, actually they, um, uh, and also uh, the gender uh, booklet uh, and um, this report I, I will share uh, as well. Uh, uh, as well as the link and I just uh, want to, sh to show you uh, how it was uh, structured uh, and the uh, working group um, uh, really collected uh, the key um, uh, key barriers uh, uh, for implementation of women human rights uh, the key problems how stereotypes uh, impact um, on women rights implementation and how how it uh, correlates uh, with uh, business practices uh, and how businesses could uh, uh, impact negatively or positively to change uh, all uh, all this um, negative impacts and uh, so on and. Um, Actually, the key message, and also you can find uh, there in this report the overview of existing standards, uh, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against uh, Women, Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, Women's Empowerment uh, Principles, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, Gender uh, Dimension of Sustainable Development Goals, OECD due diligence guidelines for responsible business conduct and how it correlates uh, to um, uh, gender sensitive approach uh, and uh, would, what steps should be taken by businesses uh, to, um, to implement um, uh, gender sensitive approach to their human rights due diligence procedure, international labor organization uh, standards. Um, and uh, also, uh, actually, yeah, the key message that we should uh, mention that uh, actually gender sensitiveness uh, should be a cross cutting element and uh, all. Uh, uh, all instruments and all tools uh, which uh, uh, are, are developed uh, on uh, human rights due diligence and human rights impact assessment uh, should, uh, of course, should include uh, um, gender component and more broadly equal e equality issues uh, component. Uh, um, and as uh, Working group uh, proposed to see uh, um, this uh, cross cuttingness uh, of gender framework. Uh, uh, they proposed um, uh, to have these uh, lenses, but again, I, I understand all uh, criticism about now about uh, uh, the formula of gender lenses because it should not be just lenses that we can use or can don't use uh, so it should be gender approach but not just lenses and actually uh, when we're talking about just lenses we um, we we are taking into consideration some vulnerabilities and uh, actually look to all these issues through the lenses of vulnerabilities and mar marginalization but um, uh, really the approach Это должно выглядеть по-разному. Так, э, оценка... Uh, on human rights and in particular on um, respect uh, to equality should have priority before such national 
regulation. Um, access, uh, assess how the state or business enterprises, uh, current and future actions or missions might uh, adversely affect women, collect uh, sex segregated data, and actually it's huge issue for our region. And again, Irina can share her experience that when we're talking about uh, um, disaggregated data based on um, any um, uh, any uh, uh, reason, it's huge, huge problem how to collect this data accordingly, uh, how to find the appropriate uh, instruments uh, to collect and how actually to interpret data, this data, it's a huge issue as well. Uh, consider intersectionality, it's also huge data, a huge issue because, um, yeah, because uh, um, this um, uh, understanding that uh, all women are not uh, the same women, it's also a huge uh, question. Um, and uh, many other recommendations about the gender transformative measures that could be uh, implemented. And actually, we see that uh, the huge transformative effect could be achieved again, I, I will repeat again and, and again, this message can be achieved just if we have, uh, uh, in general, diverse and inclusiveness environment, because it could not be just one component uh, which uh, we are ready to implement if we don't uh, ensure uh, diverse and inclusive environment in whole. And that's why I actually would like uh, to, per, to introduce our second part um, of uh, the webinar, which will be led by Beata Faracek. And uh, uh, this part of the webinar will be about very concrete uh, um, tool on diversity and in inclusion in companies. And when I read this uh, tool, uh, despite I, I was thinking that I quite experienced person on business and human rights and human rights in general, I actually opened a lot of interesting and very helpful issues. So I, uh, I, I really recommend uh, to read this tool and to implement this tool, but you will know more after the second part of the webinar. Beata, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elena, for this kind intro. And I think you've touched on a very important point, namely that uh, there is still a very big gap between uh, what we read in the academic literature about gender, di gender diversity, equal treatment, and so on, and actually toolkits and ways how to implement it in practice. Uh, because diversity is, a, as was already said, diversity is a fact, and not only gender on which we focus during the first part of the webinar, but we do all differ with either um, you know, seniority, age, um, disability, and a number of other characteristics. And every organization is diverse, or at least to some extent. Um, and when we have equality, when we have equal treatment as a human right, um, having inclusive culture can really help to, um, to meet those, this right, to, to create, to enable people um, operating in a way in an environment that helps them not only to perform work, but also to develop personally. And I think it's extremely important, particularly that we do have some data that signals that if you are forced to hide, for example, your identity, your sexual uh, identity, you probably will be less by around 25 to 30% less uh, effective because you will have to focus so much on trying not to make the mistake of mentioning that you went uh, for a trip with your boyfriend, if you're a man and so on. So I think um, companies need to also understand how much they are losing because of not being inclusive, leave alone respect for human rights being the right itself. 
um, which I think companies also very often forget that it's not being about it's not about altruism. It's about basically respecting basic human rights. And um, therefore, I'm really delighted today. And let me um, show screen. Therefore, I'm so delighted today to launch today the first, um, the English and Russian version of the diversity um, and inclusive cultures. Yes, I have a big pleasure to present the toolkit uh, already, the Polish version at least, and the English and the Russian versions, which are already also available on our website. Um, you'll find the links in the chat um, in a moment. Um, and as mentioned, this toolkit was developed already last year in Polish uh, as an outcome of the work of the DNDI Roundtable group of companies, uh, which brought together around 13 or 14 um, companies working together for over a year, um, every, meeting every three to four weeks for two to three hours and discussing a number of both ongoing issues, but also individual issues that are covered in, in this toolkit. Um, I should perhaps mention that the group started uh, in reaction to a very unjust attack by the Polish prosecution authorities on one of the companies, or actually its HR manager, uh, who actually did everything that was right. She reacted to hate speech by one of the employees and when some discussions and requests to um, rethink the behavior and withdraw some comments. Um, in the end, this person was fired. Basically, the company the, um, and the manager were uh, was pressed criminal charges for it. Um, despite the Polish labor inspection finding no abuse uh, of the rights of this uh, fired employee. So we felt at the time that it's very important to create a very safe space for those companies that are really treating diversity and inclusion and equal rights and equal treatment very seriously so that they can discuss the ongoing issues and learn both from experts, but also from each other. And uh, the work of the DNDI Roundtable, uh, one of the representatives of which we have today with us, namely Kamil Kur, whom I will introduce more in detail in a moment, um, the work of the DNDI Roundtable was coordinated by one of the best Polish DNDI experts, Dominika Sadowska, founder of the Diversity Plus and also the editor um, of the guide. Uh, it was supported by the Polish Institute for Human Rights and Business, and the process was also supported financially by the Embassy of Kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, but also the end result of it, the toolkit was made possible uh, only thanks to the in-kind support from CD Project Red, which basically designed and put together uh, graphically all the three versions, first Polish and now the two, um, the English and Russian version. Um, I should also mention that having English and Russian versions available now um, was also possible only because of the generous support of the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands as well, but also Center for International Private Enterprise, was director for global programs and the company who we have with us today as well. Um, and again, as mentioned, CD Project Red, um, due to its um, graphic design, but also NetGuru company who supported the proofreading section. Um, and in this section, just as Elena told, uh, we'll look behind the cover so we'll hear from those who are involved in the writing, in developing the guide, namely Kamil Kur. We'll hear from those who used the toolkit in practice, and that's Ms. Małgorzata Krzanos Karorkacz from LPP. And we'll also hear from Anna Kompenek, who will tell us about why they've decided to support, why they thought as an organization that it's important to uh, share, to make this toolkit available in the languages others than, than Polish. So let me introduce the uh, panelists um, who agreed to share with us their experience. And I'll start with in the order of uh, speech as we'll be going. So we have with us Kamil Kor, who is a learning technology partner at AstraZeneca. He manages equality training, um, and sorry, a learning and technology and inclusion at, and, uh, at AstraZeneca. And he manages equality training and education initiatives. He has also co-founded the LGBT QIA 
and Employee Resource Group um, at AstraZeneca. And he's also a PhD candidate at um, University of the Social Sciences and Humanities in Warsaw. And he has also completed summer human rights courses on community and action and has an interest in social inclusion of refugees and LGBTQIA+. QA, uh, uh, we have with us also, uh, welcome Camille, and we have with us also Mogorzata Szanowska-Rokac, uh, who is a D&I and external relations expert at LPP, which is the uh, biggest Polish fashion retail company. Um, she has several years of experience in managing CSR and ESG projects, and she is also a coordinator of work on the preparation of the human rights policy and diversity policy in um, of this Polish clothing manufacturer. She's responsible for managing the ethical system of the LPP group and also the implementation of the procedures related to the fulfillment of the guidelines of the EU directive on the protection of whistleblowers. Uh, she's also the initiator of cooperation with social economy entities and projects in the field of the employee volunteering. And we have also with us, as mentioned already, Ms. Anna Kompanek, who is the director of the global programs um, at the Center for International Private Enterprise at the US-based organization, but also increasingly active in Central Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And we'll hear from uh, Anna at the end. So uh, moving to our discussion, let me just start perhaps with Camille and asking you, what made you to actually join the round table and what made you to engage in the process of co-writing the DNDI uh, guide? Yes, sure. So thank you, Beata, for the introduction. And uh, so the answer to your question is really uh, very simple because uh, at the time, um, когда мы начали работу этой группы и начали работать над именно этим пособием. Я вместе с моим сотрудником с, из компании AstraZeneca, мы были вовлечены в работу. Чувствовали, что мы... There weren't many initiatives like that happening in uh, the business in the Central Eastern Europe region. So there were challenges that we were facing that were quite unique to this specific geography that our colleagues in the UK, Sweden or US, which are main AstraZeneca hubs, uh, they simply didn't relate to because they worked in different social contexts, you know. So uh, at the moment, like when we heard about that initiative, it was our gut sort of instinct. Uh, mine and Ola, who, uh, who started the group with me, to just jump on it because uh, we thought that we'll meet people who face similar challenges and we will be able to share experiences um, in order to sort of figure out the best ways to address those challenges, but also um, just for emotional release, because uh, working in the inclusion and diversity space uh, can be quite exhausting emotionally, especially if you advocate for the groups that you are part of. Um, so having a network of people who will understand you and to whom you will not need to explain uh, all the things um, but they will just get it, that I think helps and provides a level of um, psychological safety to be able to continue doing the work that we're doing. I think that's many thanks, Camille, and I think that's very important. And I'm really glad that actually that worked because that was also one of those, one of this idea behind when we were wondering with uh, Dominica whether to you know, go out to the companies and suggest getting together because, you know, we are coming from the NGL sector and now we are going to companies and say, like, come to us, right? <laughs> um, when it seems that there is much more experience with, with the other companies. And, and indeed, um, I think that was one of the biggest values also from our perspective when, when you were meeting on those regular... Changed, here's those exchanges about 
okay, we've got this and this issue right now. What do you think about it? We plan to approach it this way, but maybe you have other ideas. And I think you've, you've touched on a very important point at the beginning when you said that you were kind of lonely within the organization. And I would say very often those DNI positions, those DNI roles are just like a single person thrown into the company and um, tasked to solve all the issues related to that. I mean, it doesn't work like this. Obviously you need to engage everybody, but it, it takes time to engage other people within the company. And we'll also learn from Mogosha in a moment about that. Uh, but Camille, just to continue, um, what do you like the most? What do you find the most kind of unique and special about the DNI guide? Um, because you were involved in it. Uh, you obviously wrote a chapter about the inclusive language. But what's your kind of personal take on it? So uh, when we were writing the guide, uh, I was in a different role. And uh, my main focus at that time was uh, learning in our organization. And I was also co-leading the employee resource group as like an additional role, you know. Um, and now I moved on uh, to a role that has a functional focus on carrying out different IND initiatives. So it's, it's broader in its scope than uh, my initial work in that space. And I'm saying all of that to say that this guide came in incredibly handy uh, when I switched the roles and I had to look at IND from a more holistic perspective than just employee resource groups and grassroots initiatives. Um, so, because it covers everything from the legal landscape to hiring and retention practices, uh, to what every employees can do, what leaders in, uh, in the business can do to foster inclusion and diversity. So I really do feel like it's a holistic uh, overview and it has like the format I think works for me well as well because it has the checklists uh that summarize uh different chapters and different aspects of uh carrying out uh dnd initiatives in the organization and you can use this this checklist as like sanity checks, or, uh, expected so um it really just makes your work easier i feel like And apologies, I've done it again, of course. Uh, apologies after so many years of pandemic, still forgetting to switch on the mic. Apologies for that. Um, many thanks. Um, I think that that was also one of those elements and I'm really happy to hear this feedback and surprised or not, uh, we did have a chance to discuss those issues after the GNDI toolkit was out, uh, but obviously we didn't have a chance to study at times. And, it's good to hear it now, actually, that it did serve its purpose, not only for people who are out, who are kind of not involved, but also for those who were involved, that also for you, it brought some new elements. Um, you've mentioned several times that you have started the employee resource group at AstraZeneca, and can you tell us a little bit more about it? I know we have very tight on time, but if you could just talk, tell us in about two, three minutes about what is it and how did you start it? Sure. So uh, employee resource groups are basically uh, grassroots initiatives uh, driven by employees and for employees in the organizations uh, that aim to bring together people. And this group includes people who have common identity, common values, И они в рамках этой группы занимаются продвижением прав конкретного сообщества, конкретной группы сотрудников. И я вместе с коллегой Александрой Недведской, мы именно э, подумали, что мы должны, ос, э, мы должны заняться работой для продвижения прав сообщества ЛГБТ. 
Думаю, что в моей организации нам было немножко легче, потому что в рамках AstraZeneca уже есть такая глобальная всемирная сеть контактов. Так что мы могли обратиться к коллегам с других стран, просто спросить, как нам с этим быть, как начать вообще работу, все обсуждения. Так что мы просто собрались, подумали о том, каково наше видение, какова наша миссия, какие основные цели. Мы все это зафиксировали и предложили все это нашим, нашим управлению. И потом, после утверждения, официального утверждения нашей группы, мы организовали именно такое мероприятие. И я, наверное, предложил бы людям назначить приоритеты. Первое, связаться с людьми, которые проводят похожую работу, даже если это не работа по ресурсам сотрудников, если даже они сделают что-то другое, они, скорее всего, покажут вам перед You were tasked to actually resurrect or revive the DNTI um, as a company. And when we talked sometime later, you mentioned that you were using the DNTI guide uh, to guide your new kind of steps on this path. So can you share, tell us a little bit more about it and how you used it, how have you used it? Yes, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I must say that we are still on this path. And uh, I'm convinced that LPP will never end this journey because uh, DNI is so um, complex, it's so multidimensional that we can't say that there won't be a, a point in time when we can say that we have implemented all the initiatives, we have um, taken into account all the groups, it's impossible. So we have to admit frankly saying that uh, it's a journey and uh, we do our first steps. And uh, from my point of view, uh, what's, I must say that uh, this uh, DNI step-by-step -step guide um, is uh, something that um, I um, treat, as we say in Poland, a call to a friend because This is um, uh, something that I can um, uh, look into when I have any doubts. It's uh, a complete guidance on the um, definitions, um, good practices, and uh, much more. So um, uh, it helped me um, realize uh, that uh, diversity is something more than only um, uh, sex, age and uh, sexual orientation dimensions. Uh, it shows us that um, uh, there is much more as uh, uh, our lifestyle, our, uh, the styles of our communications. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, for example, the differences between how we want to spend our free time. Uh, these are also dimensions of um, diversity. And uh, for me, it was uh, really um, eyes opening um, because um, when I uh, understood that I am diverse and I understood my own diversity and the different aspects and dimensions of my own diversity, then I can be more, um, I can look with a more friendly um, uh, view 
to to the other people and i my tolerance and acceptance really uh, rises um uh, this is the most important thing but um, uh, also um uh, the great examples that we can find uh, in the uh, guide um, are essential um, we can't do everything at the same time we can't implement every good practice at the same time but when we um, uh, need more information um, more uh, practices we can just um, take a look and um, find in the guide um, some uh, some help Yes, so this is this is really important from my point of view, and also um, uh, what um, uh, is important for us for LPP is that uh, we need to broaden our knowledge. We need to um, uh, make awareness of uh, what diversity actually is, and uh, in the guide you can find uh, many helpful um, um, initiatives like webinars on uh, DNI uh, that cover different topics. And um, this is what we have actually started in LPP. This is our DNI Academy that covers different topics um, such as uh, microaggressions um, and uh, uh, inclusive language. Um, uh, we need to spread this knowledge within the company. We make we have to make sure that everyone understands our values uh, because this is the way we build this friendly and safe environment thank you very much Mokoshata. and could i ask you because like i said when you when you came to lpp you were basically the only person tasked with um i said kind of reviving the dni starting the process obviously you were kind of positioned within the communication and csr unit but but still you were kind of the one to to deal with all this on your own but as we know um, to ensure to create this inclusive culture, to create this cultures where people can really feel who they are. Um, you kind of need to get other people on board. You need to get um, human resources department on board because otherwise, I mean, they are the ones that are implementing hiring and retention and, you know, yes. um, um, going pr practices and so on. So what would be your practical advice for those who like you, you were, were are tasked or will be tasked to improve company D and I dimension. Where where would you tell them where to start? Yes, I would say simply don't be discouraged by the amount of work you have to do, by the different dimensions, different areas, different people you have to take into account, uh, because. Uh, the role that you have in the company is really important. It really can make change in people's lives. So um, just um, start where you are with what you have. You don't have to need a big budget to implement feminatives. Or you can simply put this guide we are talking about today uh, in your intranet. Hey. Just to and um, I think that uh, I'm truly convinced that every journey begins with the first step. And um, uh, remember that, that um, maybe uh, there is a lot of work to do. Maybe sometimes it's really um, hard to engage uh, every part of the company to, to speak up, to create something together in order to make this more friendly and a safer uh, workplace. But um, I treat it as a mission. Uh, you know, it's not only uh, the normal job, I would say, from 8 to, to uh, 4 uh, p.m. Um, I think that the mission is uh, inside this role. And I would have perhaps just last um, a bit of additional question. Was it because obviously your company you, you did undertake some questionnaires you did run some questionnaires in in the company was it difficult to convince your uh, superiors uh, the top management that it's worth investing those funds into trying to understand actually what is the composition what sort of diversity do you have and what are the issues and 
was it easy or difficult? How did they react to, if you can share, obviously, to the extent that you can share, um, how did they react to those, to their results? And I'm not asking you to disclose any of the results, but um, how do you tackle those situations? And apologies if I'm putting you yes. on a difficult spot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I must say that uh, it was difficult because we did it for the first time. And uh, when you do something for the first time, you really um, uh, don't know uh, what can be uh, in the end of this process. But we have started with understanding firstly what human rights in business um, are and what diversity really is. Uh, so um, uh, I think that when you take care about um, uh, um, spreading the knowledge before asking those people to um, participate in, in the surveys, in the questionnaires. So um, it can be uh, the, the key to, to solve um, this kind of uh, dilemma. Thank you very much, Małgorzata. Uh, and I see that our time is running out. So um, let me now turn to Anna Kompanek. Uh, as mentioned, Director for, of Global Programs at the Center for International Private Enterprise, who wasn't involved uh, in the development or the use of the toolkit, but still supported um, our query uh, or our initiative of um, translating the toolkit into English, but also for us was very important into Russian and hopefully at, at some time into other languages. But um, can you tell us what actually made you to believe in this project and uh, want to support it um, financially? But also, if you could tell us a little bit more about this um, Center for International Private Enterprise and its role and what you're actually doing in the region and why this diversity and inclusion aspect is also important for you. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Beth. And it's, it's a pleasure to uh, be here. Um, a few words of introduction about the Center for International Private Enterprise, or SIPE, since uh, it is a rather long name. Um, as mentioned, we are based in Washington, D.C., um, and we are an affiliate of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce um, and also part of the National Endowment for Democracy. So our mission is at this intersection of democracy and private sector. Uh, we work in countries um, around the globe uh, with various independent private sector organizations, so it may be um, voluntary chambers of commerce, uh, business associations, other types of uh, local private sector uh, organizations. Um, along the two lines, primarily one is to help them with their own capacity to represent their members, to help their members um, you know, operate uh, as uh, sustainable, responsible um, businesses. And then also in a transparent um, way, engage in democratic discourse on various um, policies, economic or also um, policies that touch on social issues uh, in their own um, countries. Um, diversity and inclusion uh, is not an area I would say that uh, we have necessarily done a lot of work in yet, um, but as a growing area of interest, uh, to our partner organizations and their uh, member businesses around the world, which is why uh, when we came um, across uh, your work and across this thread, it was uh, very much uh, of interest. Um, well, from a personal perspective, I'm from Poland originally, so I had the benefit of being able to read the Polish uh, original uh, version. And what struck me there was exactly um, what the other speakers already highlighted. Uh, you know, while created with the guidance and, and input from um, subject matter experts, at its core, this guide is the tool by companies for companies. So it's not a scenario where you have an international organization or a government or an NGO coming and telling businesses, you know, what to do and how to do it. It is businesses taking the existing guidance, but crucially learning from each other, leaning on each other on how to really unpack um, the DNI um, uh, subject matter, which again, as we discussed here, is huge, complex, challenging, can be overwhelming for an individual company, and especially if it's one person in that company starting uh, some kind of uh, DNI um, uh, program. 
So uh, we appreciated how practical it is, how uh, it has been created from uh, the perspective of, of companies and really responding to their um, very practical needs. Um, another reason why uh, we wanted to support the translation is that at least historically, a lot of the discourse around um, DNI has been very US centric. Uh, and of course, as we touched upon here, um, to really be effective in the space, the approach has to be shaped uh, locally by history of a particular country, uh, its demographics, uh, social structure, culture, uh, things where obviously the dimensions uh, are universal, but sort of the emphasis or the specific need to, to prioritize um, differs by country and may even differ by company depending on, on the sector where they are or particular geography. Uh, so for a change, it was, it was refreshing to see a resource in a different language that can be translated into English, into Russian, maybe into other languages to make that local experience more accessible globally. And I think in general, that is also what we need. Um, more uh, examples, more, more lessons coming from countries you know, other than the, the US, other than, than Western Europe, um, where uh, those experiences can shed the light or, or maybe help um, colleagues in other countries uh, with how they shape um, their approach. Uh, I'll pause here. I understand we are very short on time. Well, thank you very much, Anna, and both for your for joining today, despite extremely early hours back in Washington, D.C., and, um, and also for your support with the project. Um, and I'm really glad that this kind of local dimension was seen. Um, I think that's very, very important. Also, perhaps I should have said um, also early at the beginning that uh, we had a number of questions and doubts when it comes to the translation from Polish into both English and Russian. Um, I mean, those are different, like Polish and English are different types of languages. Um, in Poland, you do um, have different endings that are not visible in English. You, you don't uh, conjugate words in English. But you do conjugate words in Russian, and um, I have impression that the chapter um, that we've translated. So when we were asking translators to try to include um, kind of feminine endings in some of the sections, we we're talking to Elena that it's one of the very first attempts of actually approaching this issue um, in Russian, but also probably in. Um, other languages um, of the region. So uh, I should ask, add that even though we used very professional um, translators with whom we've worked for a long time, who are familiar with the language, uh, despite having, having the text being proofread by professional native speakers and also experts, we do realize that there might be some formulations that are that perhaps can be tackled better. And uh, therefore, at the end of um, both English and Russian version, you'll find, for example, two emails to myself and to the editor of uh, the DNI Toolkit, Dominika Sadowska, so that you can send us your comments and suggestions about how certain sections or words or formulations could be improved. Because even in Polish, um, the issue of inclusive language, it is still a challenge. It is still a new topic, and a number of people will be struggling with that. Uh, the issue of feminine endings of the name of different uh, jobs and occupations, it still raises a number of emotions. And uh, so we were trying to kind of show how this can be approached with respect to people's rights because and, and preferences, because uh, one woman might want to be called um, directorka, so kind of with a feminine ending, the other would want to prefer be called funny director, so like Miss Director, and somebody else will, will prefer to be called Director. So there are ways to handle such situations uh, with respect to how people want to be addressed. And obviously this is just one of the very uh, seemingly very simple issue, but there are many much more complex ones that, that need uh, some, obviously uh, some more thought and 
dedicating perhaps some discussions also with the higher management in the companies to, to address well um, in the company, but also with involvement of those interested. I think uh, part where we see um, always the biggest challenge and develop when introducing some new issues is that very often top management kind of saying that, okay, we've discussed it internally, we know the solution. And very often people forget to ask actually those um, to whom those um, solutions should be, for whom those solutions are being developed, whether those are the right solutions, whether those are the right answers to the challenges that they are facing at the workplace. So I think it really needs to be um, addressed um, kind of at a step-by-step -step basis. Um, I'll stop here. We've got five minutes left. Um, I don't see, I see that there was a question in, but it was already answered, but I see also um, one question from Elena in the chat. Uh, dear panelists, how you indicate prioritized issues to work in your companies in the context of DNT and I? Does your company correlate this process with human rights impact assessment or actually do you identify this process as part of human rights impact assessment at all? How do you approach it? How do you prioritize issues that you need to address? Perhaps Camille and Maugajata. Camille, yes, I see sure. you. Uh, so there are sort of two hats that I wear uh, in my organization. So one is that uh, I uh, lead different efforts functionally and the function that I sit in is spread across 40 different countries. And then I also do a bit of work locally in Poland specifically, you know. Um, and the way we went about prioritizing uh, different aspects of uh, D&I work is quite simply by needs assessment. So we analyzed uh, different HR surveys uh, that are rolled out to the organization as well as carried out our own survey. And uh, through this, we found out that for example, and the functional aspect, what we need to prioritize is um, increasing representation from all the countries uh, to make sure that everyone has a say. Uh, whereas uh, locally, uh, what uh, we've been focusing on um, recently or the conversation that has been started recently um, has to do with women's um, empowerment because we did a bit of work uh, in the LGBTQIA space and uh, the topic of women's empowerment stemmed naturally from that. Um, so I think that literally just going out and speaking to the organization is probably the best way to go about it. Uh, yes, I, I uh, can only, yes, I can only add that, yes, um, firstly, we um, identify all the areas and practices uh, which apply to, to our business and our employees, um, and uh, then we um, take a look, what can we do firstly, what can we do now? Maybe something is just uh, is is in our organization actually, and we have to just stress it and uh, um, make it a, a new introduction to to the company. And uh, some things uh, need more uh, time, uh, need more budget. So um, then it's, it's um, um, easily understood that uh, those practices will be implemented later. Thank you very much. And perhaps last question from my side before I give over to Olena to wrap up the session. Um, I think many companies are afraid that, well, introducing D&I or some other practices will cost them a lot of money and they're scared before starting and before doing any analysis. Um, other things that you can do that do not require funding, but do improve, can improve the situation, can improve the respect for rights and can, can improve, kind of can create more inclusive culture. So 
so I would say being in that position, uh, meaning that when we started our employee resource group, uh, we didn't have any funding allocated specifically for it. Uh, I think community building is one thing. So once again, going out to the organization and uh, raising your own visibility. And then another thing is obviously education. That is something that people always default to, but it really underpins uh, a lot of the work. And there are a lot of great resources out there that you can uh, repurpose, our guide being one of them. Um, but having said that, I think it is essential that organizations invest in inclusion and diversity. So while there are things that you might uh, do when you're getting started, I would encourage to, in parallel, be building a business case for inclusion and diversity. So showing the impact and the value of the work that you do so that your senior leaders know that when they invest in it, there will be return in uh, employees engagement, retention, uh, promotions and things of that sort, and also better business outcomes, because there's only so much you can do with your passion um, without running the risk of burning out, you know. Thank you very much, Camille. And I think that's very important to remember that in many companies, you've got plenty of resources within the company internally among the workers, among the employees, but it's important also not to run it dry uh, simply because of relying and kind of hoping that they can continue like this forever. Um, we are already um, after time, so uh, I'm not sure, Smokoshata, if you would want to add anything? No. Okay. So let me stop here and I'll hand over to Elena to conclude. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much to all our uh, panelists uh, for uh, the first uh, session and the second session. It was uh, really extremely interesting and uh, it uh, shows one more time that it's extremely important to share good practices and it could be really very inspiring to know what way uh, was done by other companies and it, it, it could be implemented. Um, so it's really, really interesting. I have uh, one more question, not just if we have one minute more. Um, actually, when we are, we are talking with um, companies from Eastern Europe and Central Asia, companies are saying that we don't have any complaints from our employees. We don't have facts of sexual harassment, for example. Experts are saying that there is a problem, but companies are saying that we don't have complaints about it. Um, actually, companies which already have experience of um, diversity and inclusion practices, uh, uh, do you see that uh, this situation could uh, are changing, uh, that uh, employees uh, are feeling more safety and they are ready to share their negative experience and they are actually and they hope to find solution within company i would say that um, employee has to feel safe to um, uh, put any complaints yes um, and uh, uh, Mm, at the same time, we need to assure that the channels of introducing the complaints are um, uh, well known to all of the people. And uh, uh, it's also about building the company's culture that is open, that uh, does not discriminate the people who introduce any complaints. Uh, so uh, this, these are really, really uh, wide problems and things we have to take into consideration. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So it's about uh, trust yeah, between employees and company. And uh, yeah, I, I think that it's a crucial scene uh, in the context of uh, um, equality, e diversity and inclusion 
protection and um, equal rights for all. So thank you. Thank you very much for today's webinar. And uh, we are looking for our new meetings during our next webinars.